Hi guys, this is going to be the first in what I hope is going to be a series of new videos that I am calling Design Tutor um, or Game Design Tutor, something like that. Uh, basically, a few people have, have approached me um, in one way or another to ask for my uh, help, advice, input on... Um, not not making the game for them, but just coaching them through the process of how to think about developing a game to meet the needs that you're describing. And one of those people that approached me was Tony Graham, who's one of my patrons, and Tony very kindly agreed to come and have a chat with me and record that chat for me to turn it into a YouTube video. However combination of my general incompetence and the fact that Tony's on one side of the Atlantic and I'm not and that my local broadband connection is good but not great meant that we did lose quite a big chunk of the first like 10 minutes of our conversation. Basically I kept all the important and relevant things that Tony had to say and we lost my half of the conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over straight away now to Tony. He is going to explain his design principles, what he's trying to achieve and why he's trying to achieve it. Um, and then I asked him about how long he wanted the game to be and he answered that question. And then we had our breakdown, we restarted the recording and everything after that was fine, so I will then play the conversation between Tony and myself in full uh, for you guys to enjoy. I hope you find this interesting and useful. Um, I certainly found it fun and Tony certainly uh, seemed to get something out of it. If you would like to come and have a chat with me on camera about design challenges that, that you are facing, it may be how to get started, like Tony, or it may be that you've got a certain way into a game and you've kind of run up against a, a, a mental block that you're struggling to overcome. Or, or it might even be that you haven't even got a design concept and you're not sure where to start, but you'd really, really like to write a miniatures game of your own. You've got a vision, you've got an idea, but you're not sure how to get moving. If that's you, get in touch with me at precinctomega at gmail.com and I would love to set up a conversation with you record it, and share it with the world. All right, thank you very much. I will hand over straight away to Tony. Okay, so the whole premise of it is is I want a quick, a small, quick skirmish game. Um, so think of this as, so now, uh, I mean, we've down, I went from an 1,100 square foot game room now to 1,100 square foot house, beach house, right? Um, <laughs> and, and so I don't have the room and, and table set up. And so the other thing we're getting ready to do is start doing some RV traveling for weeks at a time. And so I, but I love skirmish games. Like I found out I love a more than board game. So now I want a, a very, uh, streamlined skirmish game but yet one as simple as where i could just draw uh take a piece of paper and draw uh some buildings and some some terrain and play it with maybe something as simple as a cube or up to maybe a 15 millimeter or even be able to use like the the loki the, the flip books the battle match flip it open they are amazing and i've actually started using their i just got their adventure box and and because i'm uh strapped for space i'm using their their 2D maps and stuff for my 3D for for my 28 millimeter stuff because um, that way I can still keep 20 millimeter. I don't need all this, so I'm kind of using combining 2D 3D. But with this, um, I really want it as streamlined as possible. So if I'm sitting on a very small uh, dining room table in an RV, I can pull out a, 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 a you know sheet of paper, some cubes. And and still get the feel of a skirmish game. I don't want all. I don't want it to be a board game because I don't want all the cards and I don't want all the board game stuff. I still want the free form of a of a skirmish game. So so that's all right. So that's kind of what. And then for you know, I would like it to be where it only maybe one or two. Like I don't want to uh, control an entire squad on my end. Maybe one or two. I mean, we could have it up to to five, but I prefer to keep it one or two. Keep it everything on an index card, 
And same thing for the enemies. And maybe only have one or two enemies at one time, different types of enemies. So we're, you know, um, the less on the table I can have, the better. And then maybe the player aid, right? Like, so that's that's the dream. That's that's what my concept sort of is. So I don't want. So for me, I'm thinking I don't want a game over an hour. I would like to keep these maybe even 30 to 40 minutes because I'm thinking at the end of the day, I sit down. I'm really too tired to break out maybe a big game. I got 30, 40 minutes, um, and and I can – maybe even as quick as 20 minutes because I kind of envisioned this as maybe my first mission is I'm just trying to infiltrate, say, this building. And maybe that's only going to be like a 20-minute mission, right? Um, very sneaky, very stealthy, I get in. But the next mission, maybe now I'm fighting the enemies or I've been detected and, and you know. So I, I... I'm going to cut back in here for a moment from Tony because at this point in our conversation, I had to, to have, a, have a chat about the balance between interactions and complexity and how in a... Miniatures war game in particular, you need to think about, do you want to maximize the number of interactions you have, or do you want to maximize the complexity of each interaction and have fewer interactions? Because when you're up against a time limit like Tony was talking about, wanting to be able to finish a game in 30 to 40 minutes, you've got to decide, is this game going to consist of a small number of very complex interactions, or a large number of interactions, each of which is super decisive. And I went on to talk about the difference between doing a fantasy or medieval historical game versus a modern, ultra-modern or science fiction game. In fantasy or medieval combat, you're going to want to have a small number of interactions, each of which is highly complex. And the classic example is close quarter battle, where two people are fighting. That duel is going to involve multiple complex interactions, but that interaction itself is going to be a large portion of the game. Compare and contrast with somebody shooting another person, that's a very straightforward interaction. It's very short. It makes up a very short part of the game, so you want to resolve it very quickly, very decisively. I then went on to use Dungeons & Dragons as an example where combat in Dungeons & Dragons tends to get tied up because what you end up with is too many interactions, each of which is individually complex. It's fine if you've got one big bad evil guy, you've got effectively one interaction going on, it's very complex, everybody gets involved and it's fine. When you get more people on the board, well, that's what I'm going to go on and talk about now. So you can listen to this, and the rest of the conversation was absolutely fine, so I hope you'll enjoy the rest of this recording. And we're in. I, I'm not sure where I sort of lost you there, but we were talking about D and D combats and having one interaction with high complexity. If you then have a scenario where you've got, say, a necromancer and a whole bunch of skeletons, all of a sudden you've got a lot more individual interactions, and each of those is complex. And if you've ever run a D and D game or you've participated in one you know that the moment you hit combat everything slows down and that's why so that's the classic example of what where these two run up against each other so if you're trying to write a short narrative based skirmish combat experience you need to try and decide do i want minimal interactions maximum complexity or maximum interactions minimal complexity um so a game like zero dark goes for maximal interactions and minimum complexity. The idea of like each interaction should be resolved with a single dice roll and then that interaction is basically over. Um, but it depends on what kind of game you've got in mind. So I'm guessing that you're you're veering towards sort of either sci-fi, near future, ultra modern, that kind of stuff. Yep. You're talking about talking about guns and special forces and guys. Yes. And that tends to favour keeping interactions short. It's really useful to the mechanics, because if you think about a gun, generally speaking, a gun is a very straightforward interaction. You shoot, you hit. If you hit, bad stuff happens. 
You know, they may not actually be dead, but if you get hit by a bullet, it's not good for you, fundamentally. Right. So that favours simple interactions. If you wanted to go for a fantasy game or a samurai game or, or something more close combat-y and medieval in, in technology levels, you'd want to think about fewer interactions, maximum complexity. Because if you're talking about two heroes having a duel with swords, you don't want that to be resolved in one dice roll because that's very dull. What you want is to have them toe-to-toe -to -toe for several rounds while they exchange blows in a, in a dramatic, exciting way. And then it resolves and then you move on. So because of that, you want fewer interactions. The reason I raise this with you, because I know you're one of my patrons, I've talked on my Patreon before about um, wanting to, to write a new game and maybe do a, a video series taking people through that. And a big push has been towards maybe writing a fantasy game. And people have said, well, why don't you just reskin the Horizon Wars rules for a fantasy game? And this explains why. Ah, okay. In a fantasy game, you want to maximize the complexity of the interactions and bring the number of interactions down. So rather than vice versa. So if you want to go for a sci-fi game, we're looking to maximize the number of interactions, but keep each one resolved really simply. So have you got any kind of mechanical method in mind for this? I, I was thinking of a 2D6 system. Here's the problem. The, it's always the last system I play that I love. Right? <laughs> so, um, and this is where I have a hard time deciding what system I should use because I go, I play a game and I'm like, oh, that system's awesome. Mm. Uh, I'll play another game and I'm like, oh, I really like that. Mm. And so, like, I have all these, um, and, and same way I'm helping someone write an RPG and, and, and I have such a hard time deciding on a mechanic because there's so many good ones out there, right? Like, yeah. So how do I decide which one's best for me? Like, that's where I'm really struggling with is, is picking one and sticking with it. <laughs> Can I, interesting that one thing that's good to go back on when it comes to, go, with everything really, is to go back to your fundamentals, your, your fundamental design principles and ask, how do my choices here, or how are my choices here affected by my fundamental design principles? And in yours, we're talking about a small space. We're talking about something you can set up quickly, that you can play quickly, but also that you can play in an RV. Right. And, I mean, I mean I'm guessing in theory you'd like to be able to play it while the RV's moving. Uh, probably not. Because... <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the one driving. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, well, no, fair enough. No, probably you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing right. that. But, but if your partner was driving, you could, in theory, in theory, it could be played in a moving RV. The reason I raise that is because when you're dealing with, well, on, on a more practical level, when you're dealing with a, you know, a game that you're going to play on a single piece of paper, for example, a single piece of full scap or A4 or whatever, um, the thing with paper is it moves really easily. And when you're talking about a cheap game where you want it to be able to pack down as small as possible, you might be using standees or counters that can shift really easily. And you start to go back to the, the pure mechanics, the pure haptics of dealing with the game and say, what would make this game easier? So my gut feeling when you talked about it, you said 2d6. I thought that's a great idea, 2d6, because if you're thinking about maybe using dice as your counters, as your markers... You could build that into the mechanic and use a, a six-sided dice. The other good thing about a six-sided dice is it's an incredibly stable shape. So if your table gets knocked because somebody's moving past to get to the stove, or you know somebody jostles the side of your RV and you want to get up and shout at them, but you don't want to disturb your game, you know your D6 isn't going to move around all that much. Uh, even more stable is the D4. You know, I hate the D4 in so many ways and for so many reasons. I, I despise it. Um, but this is one of the few occasions where I can actually think that it could be a, a, an interesting choice. And even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, oh, a combination. Because the problem with using D6s for your randomizers and D6 for your counters is that they could get mixed up. 
And then you think, well, maybe I could use the D6 counter as one of my dice for rolling. But then you go, well, I've got to pick up the counter and roll it and remember where to put it back. And that's really inconvenient. What if you could use a D4 as your counter? And then that D4 automatically comes with four states already on the dice. You've got states one, two, three, and four right there on the dice. So you can put the D4 down and go, that's my counter. If you want to upgrade to miniatures, then you can use a D4 next to the miniature as a marker for the state of the, the miniature. But you could get rid of the miniatures entirely, just use the D4s. Then use the D6s as your randomizers. They're nice and stable. They're easy to get, easy to transport, easy to pack away. I mean, I've got... I know my son's right, using them. Right, you get the really small ones? Like, yeah, well, the... do you remember Games Workshop? Did, the, did a cube, a, a big D6 cube, full of... What was it? It was 9x9, nine nine, wasn't it? So, uh, no, it can't be 9x9. Nine nine. No, it was. It was 9... nine... No, 3x3. Three three. That's what I was going to say. It can't be 9x9. Nine nine. What am I talking about? Yeah, yeah. Three by three by three. So it's three times uh, uh, three is nine times three. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven little dice inside one big dice. I think they still sell them. Um, great little idea because not only do you get twenty-seven dice, I think you actually get twenty-five dice and two special. I think you get a scatter dice and something else in there as well. Um, but you also get the big outside dice, which is a great turn counter. You know, so you, it's a great little tool. I mean, Games Workshop does come up with some cool stuff. That's a, a cool thing. Um, so you could use those little dice. They pack away really easily because you've got limited space in the RV. They can be very tidy when you're not playing. Um, and then the D4s can go into a you know the dice bag or something. But the D4 is really stable on the table. Then you can roll your D6. H have you played Traveller? No. I mean, they've got a 2D6 system that is incredibly simple. And, and when it comes to a rapid resolution, is, is quite clever. Um, and for Traveller, all you've got to do is your basic test is eight or better. So okay. eight or better on a D6, on, on 2D6. And it's significant because certain things give you bonuses or negatives on, on your odds. So everybody knows that seven is the most likely result on 2D6. So the moment you've got a plus one, plus one on a Traveller roll is a big deal. You know, most rolls do not get any bonuses or they're negative, but getting a plus one is a big deal because you immediately know that it's either a seven or anything higher is success. Um, so it's it's very powerful, but it then means that additional bonuses after that become succeedingly less powerful. So you have to work very hard to get them, additional bonuses, but actually they're, they're not as significant as that first plus one bonus. Each one later makes it less significant to change once you're already you know at, at a plus three on 2d6 you're, yeah what, what's you're, the point in working to get at plus four because you basically passing everything that you ever want to do um so so that's a really interesting mechanic that you've got the basic choice is to eight or more but positives and negatives have they're very simple because it's just plus one plus one or minus one minus one but the impact of each increasing bonus is much less. So that's a, it's a really interesting mechanic, very, very simple, um, and, and great for that kind of one-off resolution. Do I hit that guy? 2d6, eight or more? No. Okay. Straight up. And you could even build in, nice thing with, two, with d6s, of course, they come in so many different colors. If you want to build in quick resolution on 2d6, you know, you can roll both dice and add them together to work out whether you hit, but one of them could be red and one of them could be blue. And the red dice you can then use to oppose, you know, that's that's how much damage do you do, say, for example. Whereas the blue one is how effective is your enemy at shooting back, for example. You know, and you interesting. Might test that again. If you wanted to go against that kind of AI, you know, solo play thing, have a yes, single roll that gives you three results, the combined roll and the individual rolls of each dice. I'm just spitballing now. <laughs> no, no, that's good because, um, because yeah, that's the other part of it is, um, you know, think of these as going to be later in the evening. Your mental capacity is not there as much. It's going to be solo. Like that's, yeah. that, you know, um, and so... Uh, I never even thought about something like that. So, so that's those are those are cool cool ideas to something to start working with. 
And I think once you get to that that point of having a, if you, if you start, and just for the sake of argument, you may come up with something way better than this as you start to think about it. But when you start with a simple mechanic like that, it's 2d6, one's red and one's blue. That's my resolution mechanic. And the red dice and the blue dice do different things and the combined result does something else. It can then start to add up to stuff that you can think about different uses for those different dice in different circumstances. So in this kind of encounter, the red dice does this. In this kind of encounter, it does something completely different. You know, you're always rolling two dice. You're always looking at the same mechanical resolution, but depending on the interaction you're having, it has different outcomes. So that keeps things, you know, very simple, very self-contained. I mean, at the moment, the whole the whole sort of system I'm de describing here, and we haven't started talking about how to control the bad guys, but it's fundamentally that the system alone would only need two six-sided dice and however many four-sided dice you want to have represent your characters. Each character can be in one of four states. Uh, you know, it can be, you know, unwounded is one, and then you can have wounded two, three, and four, like, like, zero dark or you can have each state could mean something different you know wounded you know uh, uh, it could be number two could mean i've been wounded number three could mean i've been stunned number four could mean i know i, I i'm prone or something like that oh uh, yeah that's interesting too because how would you deal with uh yeah because one of the things i want to do is keep tokens down yeah. To a minimum, right? I don't want to have a bunch of status tokens. Yeah. And so that kind of might solve a lot of those uh, status tokens. Like, I don't need wounded or prone or, you know, like, yeah. uh, or it, so. I um, mean, you'd have, to, you'd of... have to really think about, you know, if you were going to restrict yourself, I mean, I've said D4 just because I, right. I love the it's, stability of it and it kind no, of right, that... works. Um, but you, you could change your dice to, to however many status tokens you want. You know, have a, have a D8 or a D10 or a D20 or, or whatever it is, how many states you want. But obviously, the higher the number, the less stable the dice becomes. And, and so right. your D20, oh, was that D20 on an 8 or was it on a 3? Right. I can't remember. <laughs> and then the bigger your player 8 gets because you have to remember what number the state is. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't get me started on D100s. <laughs> so, Somebody once yeah. showed me a D30. Now, that is an abomination. That is an abomination. That's worse than a D hundred, in my opinion. The D thirty. That's just vile. How do you even tell? Like, I mean, ah, oh, don't, don't don't get me started. <sighs> but something just briefly just flashed through my head on the D four. We just mentioned prone. One thing with a game like the one you described is that you're going to draw out the terrain, or it's going to be it's all going to be two D anyway. Yes. Yep. So you then get oh. the problem of well. How high is that? How tall is that? Can I get over it? Can I get under it? Can somebody see me over it? Now, how you resolve how high the terrain is, you can do on the paper. You can just draw a number. But let's say, for example, uh, you were using the D4s. Each side on that D4 could indicate how the, the posture of the person that that counter indicates. So one is prone, two is kind of crouching, three is tactical movement, and four is stood completely straight up as tall as they can get. Yeah, and then immediately you can do, you've got the dice behind a piece of terrain. The terrain's got a two written on it. Your dice is on a three, and so you know, oh, that guy's visible over that, but he's concealed. You know, two of him is concealed. One's visible. That will have an impact on enemy damage. Oh, he's on a four. Two is visible. That will have an impact. Oh, no, he's, he's on two. The wall is two. Enemy can't see him. He's completely concealed. There we go. That's yeah. a, 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 a... <laughs> right? That's that's um, that's um really good because that is one of the things like with um, that I'm working on now, even like as I'm doing my my um, the, the 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 28 millimeter miniatures on the 2D, you know, Loki stuff is yeah. it's kind of a judgment call. I'm like, OK, yeah. well, that. He probably can't see him, or he probably can, right? Like, yeah. um, uh, and so having something concrete like that is is that's a pretty cool idea. Like, 
it would work really well in the context of, of what we're talking about when you're talking about a two-dimensional map that you're just drawing out at the beginning or coming out from your from your map book you know you can get a dry white marker or whatever and just write on it write on all the terrain this terrain is this high this is this high and you can even build it into stuff like you know climbing mechanics so if you know that a particular character they're you know they're four high and this piece of terrain is eight high okay so he's got to climb up four steps in order to, to get to the top of it that kind of thing so yeah you did say that's You've got an excited dog in the background there, I can. Yes, yeah, I can. I have two little two little guys. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I can tell I this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh I think it's uh it's mail time. So, uh, oh, or okay. Amazon package, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh. so let let's I think I've sort of I've thrown some ideas at you and you can you can take those away and and ponder those. The next question is obviously is about your opposition here. We're talking about a solo game. Obviously, Zero Dark uses a deck of cards to control the bad guys, which works for me, but that's not the only way to deal with uh, enemy forces. There are fundamentally, when you're playing a solo game against an enemy forces, there are fundamentally two ways to approach, and they've got kind of hybrids. But the two ways are one is randomised, and the other is decision tree. And generally, you can go fully random. You can just have, I just roll a scatter dice and a d6 and they move that far in that direction. Problem with a fully randomised enemy is they will do stuff that totally breaks your immersion in the narrative. The decision tree, on the other hand can lead you down a little bit of a gamey position. You think, well, I know, because I know the decision tree, that if I place somebody there and I place somebody there and I do this, I know the enemy will do X, Y, and Z. And that's okay, but it's it, it can, as I say, it can break you out of, just like the randomness, it can break you out of the immersion. Am I actually doing what my soldiers would do in this circumstance? They've got perfect knowledge of how the enemy's going to behave. Does that really make sense? Maybe it doesn't. Right. So you then start you... gaming the game. <laughs> right. Exactly. So then you get into, into the idea of hybridizing it. And this is what the playing cards does for Zero Dark, is that it randomizes who's going to activate and exactly what category of activation they're going to do. But then you enter a decision tree that tells you how they're actually going to go about it. Um, so that kind of tries to get a, a, a mix of the two. But you don't have to go that way. Um, the other way of hybridizing it is with something... Uh, have you ever come across Kingdom Death? Um, no, but I... So I, I, I haven't played it, but I've played Dark Souls, the board game. Right. They're... they're, they're I think they use pretty yeah. much the same concept. So you've got a custom deck of cards yep. for each enemy, and you turn a card that tells you what to do. Yep. It's a terrific solution if you've got lots of money to throw at your problem. Right. Um, yeah, it's very much what I call a fantasy fight sol flight solution, which is any problem, throw enough money at it, and you'll build a solution. Now, we yeah. don't have that luxury, you and I, um, so we've got to come up with a solution that works. Now, you could go with the deck of playing cards, but my feeling is, again, thinking about your environment, you know, somebody jogs the table, the cards are all over right. the floor, you're, all, you're like, ah, it's just a fact. But you talked about index cards at the beginning and wanting to have index cards, and those index cards have, you know, all of your hero stats and what they can do, and we keep it that small and, and manageable. And I wondered about the possibility of having a smaller collection of, or a small collection of index cards. So like maybe four, maybe up to six, probably tops, each one having a different decision tree on it. And the decision tree should be pretty simple. You know, we're talking about swift resolution. You know, you want to be able to get through that decision tree in seconds. Right. So 
And those decision trees, you can either randomize them, so you can shuffle the pack and pull one out at random, or you can take a leaf out of um, even Sorensen's game, Five Pass X from Home. You played Five Pass X? Um, I've actually not got into a full game. I can't <laughs> I keep get asking by the... you about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I can't get past the character character creation part, right? Um, I'm in exactly the same I, place. I'm still. I love his clash on, like his clash on the fringe, Chrome yeah. Hammer, Chrome Hammer Ascension. Like I love those. Right. But the five, the five X, the five leagues, I just can't get past the character creation. And, One of the features I I love that Ivan added to Five Parsecs. Um, which if I had read it before I wrote Zero Dark, I definitely would have ripped off. Um, and which will probably find its way into Zero Dark Second Edition when when we get there, is that the enemy can be in different postures. So the enemy can be ready, or the enemy can be unready, or the enemy can be tactical, or the enemy can be bestial. And they have all these different attitudes. And the attitude then dictates the decision tree that you use. And I wonder if you could do something similar so that you have a number of different decision trees, but instead of having a posture for the whole enemy force, each enemy unit could have its own posture. So have you played um, Fallout Wasteland Warfare or the Elder Scrolls Call to Arms? No, I've been, I, I've been huge into Skyrim recently. My son introduced... Well, I knew about Skyrim, but he's been playing it for a while, and, and I was finally persuaded to have a go, and, and I'm... I'm just shy of level 60 on my Skyrim hero at the moment. So oh. I am very keen to, to take the Elder Scrolls miniatures game for a spin at some stage. Yeah, so it's the first fantasy game that I've really liked. Um, and But it, their AI is really cool because they do something similar. Um, each enemy has its own like miniature um, deck, and they have whether you're... If it's aggressive or if it's... Mm. Um, uh, I think they have aggressive or cautious mm. and maybe something else and then each and then you just roll a dice and, and the card i think i have it right here to show the fallout um yeah so they all have like their own little miniature where's my his uh I ai tree that. like attack nice. he'll be attack attack move yeah and then it says kind of like the target um so he's going to go for the highest armor first, or the nearest line of sight. Yeah, and then and then so this one and this one doesn't have one, but a lot of times it'll say uh, like uh, aggressive or cautious, yeah. and and it'll, they'll kind of depending on what they. So they have their own little mini mini decision tree that, that you can look at and glance real quick. I think that was really close to what I was thinking of. I mean, I was imagining like a, a, a set of index cards with a punch hole in one corner and a treasury tag through. So that for any particular scenario, you decide, what, what kind of enemy am I facing in this scenario? And you pull out the bunch of cards for that. And each card has a different posture. And you look at which enemy is going to activate, what posture are they in, right, flick, flick. It's going to be that guy, and he's going to do X. And you go, pop, pop, and he's, he's moved and shot or, or, or whatever the enemy miniature has done. And then you move on to the next that action. So, so what's cool about that, too, is rather than like a guard always being cautious and whatever the scenario you might pull like well in this one he's going to be alerted yeah. and aggressive exactly and so so the same so not even so this you'll have the so even though the guard stats might always be the same uh his his what he'll do will change depending on the scenario depending what his um attitude or what his uh ai profile kind of is yeah yeah yes yeah, okay and, and i could really i could really see sort of I was just imagining now as well that you could have like paper clips on on the sides of the cards to indicate as as the enemy is attacked or as circumstances change you could change the places in each decision tree that an enemy starts or change where they stop you know so at some point the enemy is broken and they start running away for example you know they <laughs> They're only ever, you know, they're fixed at moving backwards. You know, they will only ever retreat. You know, they'll retreat and fire, retreat and fire, but they'll never now engage you because you've broken their morale, kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm spitballing it. I would have to break out some uh, some index cards and, and scribble it out, but that's that's your job. <laughs> right. No, but those are, um, yeah, like that's a, uh, a good idea because that was my other um, 
you know, trying to keep um, components down. Hmm. Um, and if I just had, rather than having um, uh, enemy with its 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 uh, its movement, you know, its little hmm. decision tree. If decision trees were just all over here, then enemies you could have, a, and it just seems like that would um, narrow the components down, hmm. but still allow a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Now, yeah. I was just, again, just a passing thought in my head. One of the things that I sort of set out in Zero Dark to do is to always make sure that the Red Force is fundamentally less interesting than the heroes. Um, I think in, in a movie, it can be quite frustrating to me when you have a bad guy who is more entertaining than the good guys. <laughs> um, now, sometimes it's great. There are, there are you know, cases... Um, where, where the two really work together. I'm thinking of something like Die Hard, with John McClane, and uh, what was Alan Rickman's character called? Hans? Hans, Hans Gruber. Hans. That's right. I, you know, Hans and, and, and John, great characters, both incredibly interesting and incredibly good. I mean, the fact that they were played by two such brilliant actors is probably half of why they're both so entertaining. Um, but then compare and contrast with Alan Rickman in um, uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves brilliantly entertaining up against the decidedly less interesting Kevin Costner. Um, and, you know, and Alan Rick was so much more interesting as, as the Sheriff of Nottingham in that. Um, and although obviously brilliant actor, brilliant man, great loss to acting, on a tabletop miniatures game, you never want the bad guys, especially in a solo game, you never want the bad guys to be more interesting than the heroes. The heroes are what you're there for, they have got to play. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, but you know, for that stability thing, you want markers for the for the bad guys. If you use D4s again, you're kind of making them like the heroes. Oh. And then I thought, if you were going to use markers for the bad guys, what about coins? I mean, I love coins as markers because they're easy to get. Everybody's always got a pile in their pocket and they're all automatically two-sided. And that then brings up that ultimate opportunity of well you've got you've got a two state enemy straight away they, and you can you know that you could have different states so you could have you know a pile of coins so you could have two coins or three coins so that you know as they flip over the coins disappear and get to the bottom one but the fact that you fundamentally got each enemy is only in one of two states keeps them simple keeps them manageable you can see at a glance are they in head state or tail state or black state or white state if you want to want to use some counters like that um, red or green or, or whatever you fancy. But that makes them easier to manage if you've just got two states for the bad guys to manage at any given time. Um, makes them less interesting than the heroes, but it still gives some interaction for them. No, that was just yeah. say, briefly oh, yeah, passing that's... through my brain as, a, as a, something to think about. Yeah, well, and coins... Um... They're going to be a lot harder to knock around. So if I have a cube, yeah. how you know what I mean? Like uh, uh, a coin's got some weight to it, even you Absolutely. know. Um, and and uh, I mean, you could bump it a little bit. A coin you could accidentally, or a cube you could accidentally hit, and yeah, <laughs> away it goes. Yeah, no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, and, and, and I love that about the, the two sided element of coins is is really what makes them and, and the ease of access that you can just pull out a handful from your pocket and go, look, there they are. There's my bad guy. Bump, bump, bump. They're all in head state. Now let's get them into tail state. And now let's destroy them. You know? um, the other thing with coins, you, you know, you, you almost have different, you could have different, I mean, a dime, a penny, different sizes, like up to your yeah. quarter, who's the, the, the nemesis. Yeah, so that exactly. was like, like, um, that was like a fantastic, like addition to, um, uh, to zero dog. To zero dark is yeah. the nemesis like because that is really just brought the to me brought the game out it, it gave you like this pesky person that's following you around now felt more actually, like a movie kind of thing right like a it's like, a really good in a way it's a good example of what i just said about that the you don't want the bad guys to be more interesting than the heroes because the point of the point of the nemesis is that that he's is the nemesis he or she or it is interesting but for most of a campaign it's not on the tabletop the focus is on the heroes when the nemesis turns up, now the focus is on the nemesis, but that's narratively appropriate. Now right. the heroes have to defeat their nemesis. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I was, um, 
It's it's fun. It, it can be a little bit wild um, sometimes. You end up with a nemesis that is is practically unbeatable. Um, it does happen, but hey, I, I just think that's part of the fun. Right? Yeah. And no. And no. And as it's building up, and even as you're building it, and you're not beating it, and, and then there's always it, it's always back there, right? Like I got to get through this mission because this nemesis is getting really tough, and I'd rather not have him come out right now. <laughs> and and the earlier the nemesis turns up, the less interesting they are. So if you get to see more than one nemesis in a campaign, you know, they haven't had as far to develop, so they're not yet as interesting as a more advanced one. But if you beat that one, the next one automatically gets bonuses. So it, again, naturally becomes more interesting the next time you see it. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's interesting. You could use different size coins for absolutely for that very, for that yes. very thing. Yeah, absolutely you could. Is there anything else you would like to throw out and discuss with me and, and thrash out movement oh, <laughs> i am okay. on a little piece of paper right that is a good point that is um, a really good point and so yeah. um that's the other thing i'm like do i just uh and it, it technically it could be different s scales i mean it's gonna be abstract a little bright but depending how people draw or how detailed they get uh you know compared to their so um that's the other thing I was trying to get. And because a piece of paper can be small. I mean, I pr prefer it. So yeah. I would like to be able to play it on a single piece of paper. I'm still thinking more like two to give you a, a little more space. Mm. But movement, you can get engaged super quick, right? Um, so that that balance, that how do we figure out, how do I figure out uh, a, a decent movement scale? I, I was, guess, well, so you know, I was reading, oh, damn it, what was it? I was reading a game the other day, and I can't remember if it's one we already discussed or it's one I haven't reviewed yet. But oh, what was it? You might know. There was a game I was looking at recently that was played on a very small space. Might No, no it wasn't Spectre Operations. I thought it was for a second, but it's played on a two foot by two foot square. And there are no movement values. Um, you can move wherever you like. Rogue planets like that. Like you move up to you hit a like a, a terrain feature. Maybe it was Rogue Planet. Yes, maybe that was. I think that might have might have been Rogue Planet. And it. This seems like the kind of environment where you could use something very similar. In a very I... small space. You know, why worry too much? You know, if your heroes want to run that far, let them run that far. Now, obviously, you'd have to think about what, how to balance that just to stop them all just running straight into the objective or whatever it is. You know, there'd need to be limits. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily need to introduce stuff like, like a measuring stick in this. Right, you just go... No, I can move wherever I like. I can hit whatever I, I, I'm looking at. That's the lovely thing about a sci-fi skirmish game is is that to an extent you can always go, no, I can always, I never have to worry about range, especially on something as small as this. Everything is always going to be within range. You know, the only question is whether I roll well enough to hit it. Right. Interesting. Because um, that also eliminates the need for something to measure with. Yeah, um, exactly. So talking about wow. taking things out that you don't need. Right, right. Yeah, so I, I don't know why that never even crossed my mind. And I haven't played I've read the rule book a bunch. I've never played it because I was always kind of hesitant. Mm. Um, but this is a good time now to, to break it out and actually play it then and see how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know I think you have to have – you're supposed to have so much terrain out. That way, you know, your, your character has to run into um, – and then there's some – they use some um, – I think you can move as far as you want, but if you move into a line of sight of an enemy, then too, there's some, there's so it's not, yeah, you can run across a table, but you're going to expose yourself or, um, you know, thematically, exactly. like yeah, if yeah. you run in front of an enemy, you're going to get shot at. Yeah. So for example, you, you could say, you know, at the end of your move, the number of enemies that get to react is the number of enemies that have a line of sight to you at some point along your movement. You know, so the further you move, the more enemies get to react. Whereas if you move really cautiously and very slowly, you know, fewer enemies are going to get to, to react to you. Right. Yeah, so anyway, that, that, that was my initial thought on movement that, that uh, kind of works 
Now yeah, I no, I, I that's that's um I like that, and I don't know why I never that never even crossed my mind. I was so fixed on measuring for some reason, yeah. or trying to decide. My other one was trying to decide zones, but I'm like, no, if you're just pulling out a map book, that doesn't make sense either. I mean, map books map books have grids, but if you just want to write on a piece of paper, they don't. Hmm. So I was trying to come up with, but um, but if you ever yeah. do need, if you ever do want, or if you as you work on it, you think, no, I really, really do need a measuring device of some sort. Um, the one that I particularly love, and I'm sure I've got some handy here somewhere. Where have I put them? They might be at the bottom of my I, uh, enormous bag of dice and other devices. Mm, no, can't find it. No, can't see it. Right. Um, bamboo skewers. Oh. Uh, I'm sure I've got a box of those somewhere. Two secs. These. So they're very pointy on one end, so I generally recommend that you, you cut the pointy end off. Uh, but you can, you know, I'm fairly sure you can get them on grocery stores on both sides of the, uh, of the Atlantic. Yeah. And, uh, and what you do is you, you measure them in advance, and you kind of... This comes straight out of uh, A Song of Blades and Heroes, who have... They use movement sticks. Um, and I, I used movement sticks in a game that I wrote a long time ago, uh, which I need to develop some point, and it was called it was called New Little Wars, um, and it was inspired by H. G. Wells's book uh, Little Wars. But the idea was it was supposed to be offering a framework for teaching um, mathematics to uh, elementary school children um, through the medium of miniature wargaming. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but one of the things, it used me measuring sticks, and it had measuring sticks that had uh, three different ranges painted on it. So I'd, I'd cut the end off, and I think I can't remember how long I made it, only like six inches or something. And so it was marked at two inches, four inches, and six inches, just like that. And so you'd have close range, medium range, and long range. And so you just put down a stick, and that, that was the, the measuring thing on, on each device. And so movement, you know, you'd have... This guy can move short, this guy can move medium, this guy can move long. And the whole idea was to try to encourage children to start with a very, very simple set of rules and work out what they could add to it to make it a more interesting game. So it wasn't mathematics in the sense of arithmetic, it was mathematics in the sense of probability and logic uh, and decision making. Uh, one day I will I will finish writing that book. Now, <laughs> those, those are round though, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. I think I've seen them. I've seen them somewhere. I don't know if they were in a hobby store where they're um, square, because those would sit like you know, is, if you're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or um, you could, uh, uh, yeah. The um, local model railway store to us does a whole range of um, plastic styrene pieces in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. And you're right; they do one which is just. Um, uh, Square cross section, square. and you can I'm buy thinking... it in like two meter lengths, and, and just yeah. cut it to the right length if you need to do something like that. Movement sticks are a great way to eliminate the faff of tape measures if you're using a very short range stuff. Normally, it's perfect for fantasy skirmish gaming, but because you're talking about sci-fi on a very small surface, it, it would work equally well for you. Okay, cool. Um... Yeah, because those are, yeah, so, so that's good. And then, so uh, probably the range is going to be the, the same thing when it comes to weapons. I mean, we're sci-fi, we're short distance. Yeah. I uh, pretty much have a weapon that's going to hit I'd you. I'd almost say <laughs> even more than movement, you can almost certainly just go, if you can see it, you can shoot it. Um, and, I mean, you can worry about questions of, oh, well, yes, but should my odds of hitting something at long range be more or less than my odds of hitting something at short range? Uh, I, I think for a quick, 
fun narrative skirmish game like you're describing, there's a point at which you go, ah, just just don't worry about it. Just hand wave it and move on. Um, it's one of the, the problems in game design that you do see. You see a lot in people like me. Um, I do it all the time, overthink a design. Because we're so determined to do something different. We're so determined to get away from those, you know, very basic deterministic Games Workshop style mechanics that we're constantly trying to add new little moving parts into our Heath Robinson machine. Um, but actually what you want to do occasionally is just go, look, just just don't worry about it. If you can see it, you can hit it. You, you can hit it okay. on a six. doesn't matter. It can be at one end of the board or right in front of you, you're hitting it on a six plus. Okay. Which actually flies in the face of something I've, I have said before about absolute determination but it's what bugs me in range isn't absolute determination but absolute range i probably listen i've podcasted about this before i hate it when a weapon has an absolute range you know 24 inches you can hit something on a six plus on 25 inches you can't hit it at all not a chance never gonna hit it never ever ever uh that that just pisses me off yeah. So, uh, so I, I don't like that. But the idea that you could hit something in front of you on a 4+, plus and something on the other side of the table on a 4+, plus, that doesn't bother me in the slightest. Because if you... Are you a, a gun guy? Are you a range? I don't hobbyist? like... So, um, I mean, I have... I have some, uh, I'm a concealed carry guy. Right. I got my, and I go to the range, but I, not like overly, yeah, you yeah. know, um, but I... Just when you're you talking know, I, about long arm weapons, actually, you know, yes, when you're getting out to something like 400 meters, your odds of hitting it dramatically start to reduce. But when you're talking about your odds of hitting a moving target at 100 meters versus your odds of hitting a moving target at, at, at 10 meters, actually, statistically, the odds aren't that much different. So you, you can definitely hand wave that stuff. Okay. And that's what I think one of the best things I love about Zero Dark 2. I love how that's handled, right? Like, yeah. you can shoot it, like, but your odds are going to go down, right? Exactly. Like, well, but, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's, that's, that, that's the Horizon Wars mechanic, is, is the diminishing odds. Oh, everything's possible. The odds are just really, really low. <laughs> right. Yeah, and then since this is so much smaller compared to the that scale, right? Yeah. Like, there probably shouldn't be that diminishing, like, yeah. Um, especially in sci-fi, if, if you can't hit something that close i mean i was I, yeah. I had some friends around to play some i was teaching them the versus game of zero dark the other day and they're around and one of them was saying oh God, i'd love to shoot because he was on one side of the table the other guy was on the other side and there was a defense mech enemy defense mech between them and he's like i'd love to shoot that defense mech oh no what was it the defense mech or was it the boss might have been the boss rather than the mech can't remember he's like, i want to shoot oh the boss I want to shoot the boss i said well you can shoot the boss but you're going to need four twelves from that range, your only chance of actually killing him is four twelves, because that's the only way you're going to do enough wounds that you're actually going to kill the boss. Otherwise, your best chance is just taking away support tokens. Yeah, that's it. So it, it's possible. I said you can you can do it if you like. It's right. just very unlikely. Right. <laughs> yes, I like that. Right. It it uh, it just doesn't feel limiting, even though it, it, I mean it is limiting. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um. You're not going to do that, but I, I can, <laughs> right? Twice. Psychologically, Twice. it just feels less restricting, even though yeah. um, physically it, it still it still is. I mean, but um, okay. So, anything else you wanted to look at? I bring up. Uh, see if I can bring up my. I think that was. I was going to bring up the doc real quick here. Uh, okay, so I think that's um, I think that's that's about it. The only other thing would be so if we're doing two D six system is um, it is would be like stats. I mean, right. doing stats on a game like this. Um, I what I love so I love not a lot of stats like mm. i not having stats for like every little like an rpg like so it, it like in zero wars to me that's you just have a few stats right yeah or, i mean horizon it, wars is always the 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 thought the mfid it, it, 
I, I mean, I always start with MF, A, and D, and then I always find it's not enough. So, like, in Zero Dark, you then you've also got the Cylinder, and you've also got Armor Value, you've also got Firewall. Uh, and then in um, uh, Infinite Dark, you've got Mass, and you've got Power as well. But MF, A, D sort of sits at, at the core of it as the, the four key stats. But the nice thing about what you're doing, because it's, you know, it's something that you're making up yourself and that you want it to be compressed. Actually, stats is the one area where you can afford to add on some detail if you want to. So if you want a variety of different interactions, actually, you may think about, right, what variety of interactions do I want? Now, what kind of stats do I need to support in my suspension of disbelief that variety of, of interactions? Because really, I mean, you can... You can go as far as you like. I mean, you can. I remember early Warhammer. I can probably still do it from memory. They had movement, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, initiative, attacks, intelligence, leadership, willpower, and cool. That was it. And armor save. So they had all of those stats. Um, now that was excessive at the time, and they realised that by second edition, and they they cut it way back eventually. But in a game like yours, you can get away with that. You can add, you know, 10, 11, 12 stats if you've got the variety of interactions that you want to be able to undertake. I mean, I, I like to make one stat do a lot of work, which is why, you know, I, I get it down to those four. Um, but there's no reason you can't split it up. Okay. Uh, and, and just create more. I mean, I remember I did some work on a a role-play version of Infinity the game, way before there was an actual role-play version of Infinity the game. And one of the things which I was doing was that they have a stat in the miniatures game that's WIP, willpower is what it's called, it's WIP. And I thought that was the only real mental stat in the miniatures game. And I thought it'd be really interesting to break that apart. And so I broke WIP up into W was still willpower, but then I was insight, Ah, and P was perception. And insight was like about your intellectual ability to understand information, whereas perception was your ability to see things physically in, in the environment, and willpower was your ability to you know, resist pressure and, and, uh, and stay on task, and that kind of stuff. And I'm not sure it was a particularly good idea, but it was that idea of taking a core single idea of willpower, mental stat, and then breaking it up into more complex more granular stats for different circumstances. And it's, it's classic what role plays games do. And because you've got a narrative game here, you can you can get away with doing more. More. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those I just need to kind of create scenarios. What what would I want to do and then what would I need to do to accomplish this? So like if I'm sneaking in and, and hacking a computer, if I'm uh right, um if I just need to observe intel or i don't know yeah. but like kind of write scenarios out and say okay what what stats make sense for these scenarios yeah and it's of. and it's how immersive you want to be about it as well so you could have a single you know intelligence stat like i've got acuity in zero dark you just got the one intelligence stat and you use that for medic and you use that for hacking and you use that for making conversation with people which is again which is what i do in zero dark or you could say, no, 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 computer science is its own skill. And then, you know, the ability to, to talk and persuade somebody is a separate kind of interaction that needs its own stat. And then the ability to you know, medic somebody and repair their, their wounds, that too is a new kind of thing, needs a different kind of intelligence. So you, you can get as granular as you like. Uh, I mean, I'd say generally, I think once you get beyond 10 stats, you're probably over yeah, that, that particular project. Right. And also, because this is an evolving thing, you could do like Games Workshop. You know, Games Workshop started with 12 stats and then, then realized rapidly that they didn't need them all. So you can make up loads. And then as you go along, you can go, actually, do you know, I, I never use that one. Let's just get rid of that. Or that one's really like that other one. Or I keep forgetting when I'm doing this test. Should I be using this stat or this stat? Well, obviously, hey, maybe I could use both. Or maybe I could use a combination. Or... I just get rid of one of those stats because I don't use it for anything else. It's always that one. You know, so you can you okay. can play test your way through that stuff. People, okay. it's, it's funny actually. Stats, and I have to put my own hand up to this because when I first wrote Horizon Wars, I start. Did I start with stats? 
I might have actually started with stats before moving to dice. And that is completely the wrong way around. You should adjust your stats to suit the game, not the game to suit your stats. Um, I, I can definitely, because I, I wrote the basic mechanics for Horizon Wars in about 20 minutes sat up in bed one day. Um, and and I, I'm pretty sure I started with the stats. I think I knew it was going to be D12, but I didn't have anything else about that in the mechanics. I just like D12s. And I think I wrote the stats and then worked out how I was going to play the game using those stats. That is the wrong way around. Today, okay. it would be the other way around. I'd work out the game first and then filter okay. down which stats okay. I actually need to play it. Cool. Okay. So I think um, I think that covers like the basics for everything to get to actually get something down and going. Awesome. Well, that's and then yeah. con conveniently that's after I've edited that this is just about an hour for for the conversation as well. So that's fantastic. Cool. Brilliant. Well, listen, I'll I'll say farewell for now because I have to go and make dinner for my family. Okay. Um, but uh, stay in touch. Let me know how it goes. And, uh, and maybe when you finished it, you can come back onto the Patreon and, and share the results of your of your writing with, with the other patrons. And we can, yeah, we can absolutely. enjoy the benefit of your work. Yeah, absolutely. So I appreciate this greatly. This is awesome. Um, this is one of those things, like, I just need this kind of thing to get going or else I would just, you know, like, so. Well, thank you so really much, honey, awesome. for letting me, let, for, thank you so much for letting me record it. Uh, it. When I get around to editing it into something presentable, I will I will let you know. And you okay. Can, uh, you can watch yourself talking to me all over again. Okay. <laughs> right. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Tony. I'll yep. let you go. Thanks a lot. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Precinct Omega podcast. These people that are appearing on your screen right now are my brilliant Defence Mac patrons, and it is thanks to them and all the other patrons on the Precinct Omega Patreon that this podcast exists. Please, if you've enjoyed this episode, do consider going along and supporting the Patreon uh, from just one pound a month. Everything helps and means that I can keep making these podcasts for your amusement, interest, and entertainment.